continue the service. There we go, the microphone's on. And we're going to continue with the Shema. Would everybody please stand up? And you have in your pews these little cards. And we face the city of Yerushalayim, which is actually facing that way. So let's everyone you know, go east, face east, and we're going to sing the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem, Kevod Malchuto, Le'olam Va'ed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever. Amen. Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha, v'chol levavcha, v'chol nafshecha, v'chol meodecha, ve'ahavta. Et Adonai Elohecha, v'chahu levavcha, v'chahu nafshecha, v'chol meodecha. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You may be seated. Yamod Cesar. Baruch Hu et Adonai HaMvorach Baruch Adonai HaMvorach Le'olam Vohen Baruch Adonai HaMvorach Le'olam Vohen Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Bachar Banu Minkol HaAmim Venatan Lanu Et Turato Baruch ata Adonai, no tain ha Torah. Amen. And in English, blessed be the Lord who is to be blessed. Blessed, blessed be, be the Lord who is, who is to be blessed forever and ever. Blessed be the Lord who is to be blessed forever and ever. Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all people and has given us your Torah. Blessed art thou, O Lord, giver of the Torah. <clears throat> so this morning's reading is going to be on 2 Samuel, chapter 15. 2 Samuel, chapter 15, verses 22 through There's still some ruffling right here. <laughs> All right, so I'll, I'll go ahead and begin. <clears throat> and in Hebrew it reads, Vayomer David el ite lech vaavor vayavor ite hagiti vechal anashav vechal hatafashia itov vechal haaretz bochim kol gadol vechal haam Avorim vehamelech over benachal kidurom vechal haam Ovrim al pnei derker et hamidbar. And in English it reads, therefore, Dave, therefore David said to Itai, Go and pass over. So Itai, the Gittite, passed over with all his men and all the little ones who were with him while they were while all the country was weeping with a loud voice all the people passed over the king also passed over the brook kidron and all the people passed over toward the way of the wilderness sign 
Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Natan Lanu Torah Temet Vechaye Olam Natab Betochenu Baruch Ata Adonai Noten HaTorah Amen Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the law of truth and has planted everlasting life in our midst. Blessed art thou, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. It was spring. I was on a speaking tour in the Midwest, and I was coming back, and I was in Wisconsin. Beautiful state, by the way. Oh. And I saw a sight I had never seen before in my life. Flocks and flocks of geese just flying through the sky. Beautiful sight. Their aero formations, some bigger, some smaller, just tons of them. And it was the coolest thing. You know, I'm driving, you know, 60, 65 miles an hour, and I just keep seeing them. So there's, there's thousands of these things all over the sky. It was the coolest thing. You ever wonder how they know where they're going? And they've always got one guy, gal, in front. And all the others just follow along. What if the one in front gets lost? Or what if the one in front is just a rascal and says, you know what? I think today we're going to Connecticut. Just changes his mind. It would be complete and utter chaos. It reminds me of some of the birds, the pigeons around here. You know, you confuse them. They just start flying in circles for a while. They're not sure where they're going. and See, they get into a circle and they're following each other. Eventually, somebody's got to figure out, hey, dudes, we're flying in circles. Let's stop this. It's the craziest thing. Today's lesson is called Follow the Leader. And I was just thinking of the chaos that can happen if you don't. And that's really what's going on here in 2 Samuel 20. To remind you, for those of you who weren't with us the last few weeks, David's son, Absalom, rebelled, led a coup, tried to kill his dad and take over the kingdom. Thank God he failed, and he ended up dying in the ensuing civil war. David and his men are now heading back to Jerusalem. They're crossing the Jordan River, heading back to Jerusalem. Now, David's tribe is Judah, but there's 11 other tribes in Israel, and most of the other 11 are just called Israel. So what happens, a bunch of people get all attitudinal. Okay, they just had a civil war. They just had a rebellion. David was victorious. He's heading home, and a bunch of leaders come up and say, how dare you guys escort David home without inviting us to escort David home? Yeah, let's fight over that. The honors of who gets to escort the exiled king home. Let's fight over that, why don't we? Because it's not like we don't have enough to fight about. The civil war was too short. Let's have another one. People don't think. Or maybe they think too much. Now a troublemaker named Sheba son of Bichri, a Benjaminite, a Benjamite, happened to be there. He sounded the trumpet and shouted, We have no share in David, no part in Jesse's son. Every man to his tent, O Israel. So all the men of Israel deserted David to follow Sheba, son of Bichri. But the men of Judah stayed by their king all the way from the Jordan to Jerusalem. <laughs> Poor David. He just went through this horrible tragedy of his own son trying to kill him, civil war and his son being killed. It's all better. He's heading home. Who's Bickery? What is this guy? And everybody's going with him? These people were rebellious. They haven't gotten it out of their blood just yet. Unbelievable. Now, the NIV, I just read to you, it says troublemaker. Uh, the New King James Version says rebel. And the New American Standard says, worthless fellow. So I figured, okay, i got to see what's going on in the Hebrew here. Why can't these guys agree? The word is, it's actually a few words, man of Belial. 
That's what it should say. That's the translation, a man of Belial. Now this bickery, a man of Belial. But since we don't know what man of Belial means, instead of translating it, they interpreted it. And their interpretation is subject to debate. A man of Belial. Belial said, you look it up in the concordance, in the lexicon, it says it means worthless or wicked. Okay, that's as close as we're going to get, I guess, worthless or wicked. But Belial was also a name in ancient Israel as a synonym for Satan. So when it says he was a man of Belial, the implication was he was being influenced by Satan. Not, it, they're not saying, oh, he's possessed. That's not the point. They're just saying he's evil. He's more of a son of Satan than he is a son of God. He's more of a bad guy than he is a good guy. That's what it's saying about Bikri. I understand why they translated it rebel, because he rebelled. In his imitation of Satan, he manifested his bad nature as a rebel. But it doesn't mean rebel. It just means a bad man, a worthless, wicked man. So putting the context together with the phrase, man of Belial, I came up with this. Rebellion is a fruit of a wicked, worthless man whose behavior is in line with Satan. So Bikri says, everybody come to me. And he leads the next coup. Well, David's back on the throne. He's not taking any prisoners, if you know what I mean. He sends his guys after Bikri. Bikri and his men hole up in a town called Abel. They surround it. They're ready to lay siege and destroy Abel. And this woman, wise woman, the scripture says, looks over the wall and says, let me talk to the leader. Joab comes forward. Are you leader? I'm the leader. Why are you trying to destroy us? We're a good, peaceful town. In fact, we've got a reputation of solving problems. What's the problem? He says, we're not here to destroy you. Bickery's holed up in your town. He's a rebel against the king. We're here for him and him only. The lady says, I'll go get him for you. <laughs> she didn't quite say it that way. She goes back to the guys of the town. She talks and she talks. And then she has his head flung over the wall. I told him I'd get him for you. My words, not the Bibles. Joab took his men. They went back to Jerusalem. Bickery's head on a platter. It's all good. That's all they needed was to kill the rebel. And the war was over just like that. You know, Abel was a good town. But they got dragged into something. Because these bullies, these bandits, I don't even know what to call them. These rebels decided to hole up in their town. Now listen, people. You know this, but i got to tell you. Sometimes trouble will find you. You don't always have the option of avoiding trouble. I don't want to have... You know, if this woman said, hey, this isn't our business... Joab would have said, it's going to be when we break down your walls and kill you all. There's a time when trouble will find you and you have to deal with it. You may not like to, but turning your back on it is also making a decision. From Joab's perspective, you're either with us or you're with the rebels. You decide right now because we're breaking down the doors. This woman realized she had to make a decision and she was a wise woman, the scripture calls her. Sometimes trouble is going to find you. You may say, I don't want to get involved. Fine, you avoid trouble as much as you can. But when it finds you, man up, woman up, and make the right choice. Because turning your back and just letting it be is accepting of the wicked. You're right, it's not your fight. You shouldn't be involved. That's now irrelevant. It is now your fight. You are involved. Now you've got to choose sides and make strong decisions. That's what happened in Abel. It's sad, but it all worked out well. So I'm reading through 2 Samuel. Absalom leads a coup. Uh, Sheba, or Bikri, or whatever his name was, led the coup. I think his name was Sheba, son of Bikri or something. But everybody's suffering because of what these guys are doing. Now, these people are willing participants, but without a leader... They'd just be a bunch of pigeons circling. But with the leader, they're heading to Fort Connecticut. Heading in the wrong direction, but they're following the leader. The Bible says this, For rebellion is like the sin of divination or witchcraft. 
and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. This is parallelism. This is, you see this in Hebrew scriptures all the time. He could have just said, rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. End of sentence. But he doesn't. He builds on it to further expound his point. Rebellion is like the sin of uh, divination or witchcraft, and arrogance like idolatry. Witchcraft or divination goes with idolatry, and rebellion goes with arrogance. And it makes perfect sense. Why would anybody who's not arrogant rebel? A, a rebel is like, I can do better. I should be leading this country. I should be the new king. So the foundation of all rebellion is arrogance. And the Bible tells us it's evil. It's of Belial. Rebellion is of the devil. He's the first rebel in all of world history. He rebelled against God. Now that was stupid. That was just stupid. I, I don't even get that one. Must have been that arrogance thing. Made him think he was better than he was. So rebellion is of the devil. On the flip side, submission is of God. The Bible talks all about submission. Submission to authority is God's program for all of us. Throughout life, we all get the opportunity to lead and we all get the opportunity to follow. But there are certain instances where God lays out the program. And in the Bible, it tells us we're to be submissive to our civil authorities. We're supposed to be submissive to our spiritual authorities. And we're supposed to have submission within the family. So I'm going to talk about those three things this morning. Submission to civil authorities, submission to religious authorities, and submission within the family. First, we'll start with civil authorities. I'm going to read from, from the Old Testament and the New Testament. It hasn't changed. Deuteronomy 17. Go to the one place of worship chosen by the Lord your God, and present your case to the Levitical priests and to the judge who is in office at that time, and let them decide the case. So there were these local authorities, but sometimes the cases were too hard for them. So they'd send it up to the Supreme Court, as it were. They will give their decision, and you are to do exactly as they tell you. Accept their verdict and follow their, their instructions in every detail. Can this get any clearer? They will make the decision. You do what they say. Anyone who dares to disobey either the judge or the priest on duty is to be put to death. In this way, you will remove this evil from Israel then everyone will hear of it and be afraid, and no one else will dare to act in such a way. God said, this is my program. I'm going to have people in authority. They make decisions. You do what they say, or you die. One, you know, there's a lot of things in life that bother us, and we all have our pet peeves and things that anger us more than others. One of the things that really annoys me in the world is when people riot. Oh, we won the football game. Let's destroy downtown. And what, what gets me mad isn't that they're rioting. What gets me mad is that the cops' hands are tied and they're not allowed to do anything about it. Oh, we shot a rubber bullet and poked out somebody's eye and we got a $3 million lawsuit and we lost. Lost? You should have been shot with a real bullet in the head. These people are destroying society. Stop them. Well, they're just exuberant kids. Fine, let them destroy their own house. They're coming to my house, I'm shooting them. And our country doesn't stop evil. God said, when they tell you to stop, you stop or you die. So it's my pet peeve. It's my soapbox. Arab Spring. <laughs> In all these Arab countries, hey, I'm an American. And I'm thankful I'm an American. And I'm a God follower. And I'm thankful I'm a God follower. But this applies to other countries too. All these rebels in Egypt and Syria and Jordan, you know, all they're doing is throwing away one dictator for another one. It doesn't help anybody. Uh, but that's their problem, not mine. So that's what the Old Testament says. Here's what the New Testament says. 
Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. I don't care if you don't like what I'm about to say. Barack Obama is our president because God wanted him to be our president. Do I like his policies? No. Totally disagree with probably 102% of his policies. But he is our president. I'm thankful I live in America because after four years we can change our mind about any president. And I'm hoping that everybody will have had enough and vote for a new president. But if they don't, that's fine. He'll still be our president. And he'll be my president. He's there because God wants him there. Why does God want him there? I don't know. But when you look back in history, God put the Romans there. God put the Assyrians there. God put the Babylonians there. So we'll take what God dishes out. Listen again. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. In some of the liturgy that Michael was leading us in, it was talking about how God makes us rich or makes us poor so that we can learn to submit and love him more. I threw in that word submit, I think. Trust him more was there. So maybe we've got this president so we as a nation can get off of our lazy butts and get a little more active in society. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. He's in there for a reason. God knows the reason. Ours isn't a question. Ours is to submit. It's irrelevant how good the authorities are. This was written, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except which God has established. Was written when Rome was in power. Rome! Talk about bad government. You don't want to mess with Rome. You mess with Rome, you get crucified. That, that was one of the primary... Uh, if you were crucified, there was a good chance you were a rebel. Somebody who rebelled against Rome got crucified. Others got crucified too, but rebels got crucified. Those two guys who were crucified next to Yeshua, they were rebels. At least one of them for sure. The other probably. God says you obey the authorities. They didn't obey the authorities. We're Jews. We don't have to obey Romans. Uh, God put the Romans in over Israel in case you hadn't paid attention. Let God pull them out when he's ready. In the meantime, you do what they say. You know, Jeremiah the prophet almost got executed for, for this. He said, God is sending Babylon to punish and discipline us. Do what they say. Don't fight. Submit. And they were going to kill Jeremiah for those words. Well, the people who fought died. Those who submitted went off captive, set up pretty decent lives in Babylon. Babylon was pretty comfortable, actually. They'd only had listened to God. It was time for God to punish them. Maybe it's time for God to teach us something. Let God be God. It's irrelevant how good the authorities are. We're not obeying the authorities. We're obeying God through the authorities. There is an exception to that rule, and it's important that we know it. Peter and John were commanded to stop preaching that Jesus was the Messiah who died for our sins and rose again. The authorities told them that was illegal. They were not permitted to do it because they were causing discord and it was the wrong religion. So the authorities had a legitimate reason to tell them from their perspective. But the authorities were frankly wrong. Here's what Peter and John said. You yourselves judge which is right in God's sight, to obey you or to obey God. For we cannot stop speaking of what we ourselves have seen and heard. If the authorities tell you the speed limit's 55, it's 55. If they tell you you've got to pay 33% of your income tax, it's 33%. If they tell you you can't buy gas on Tuesday, you don't buy gas on Tuesday. If they tell you you're not allowed to pray to the God of Israel and not allowed to, to worship, you tell them, too bad. If they tell you it's not a lot, you're not allowed to tell people about Jesus, you tell them anyway. Because you've got to obey God rather than man. And if proclaiming Yeshua is against the law, be ready to pay the penalty. You might have to go to jail. But that's okay. Yeshua went to jail. Peter, Paul, John, they all went to jail. If that's what it is, that's what it is. Whatever. We obey God. 
So we're to obey our leaders unless they order us to do something contrary to God's written word. Other than that, we obey to the best of our ability. National News, September 13th, 2011. So just this month, a couple weeks ago. Headline, Amish men jailed for not displaying buggy safety signs. So, a group of Amish men were told, you've got to put these reflective triangles on the back of your buggy so nobody runs into you. Traffic laws. Makes good sense. The Amish guy said, no. It's against our religion. We're not allowed to wear brightly colored things, and our safety shouldn't be in symbols but in God. It was against their religion to wear triangles on their buggies, and so they went to jail. It's exactly where they needed to go. And if they don't put their triangles up next week, they should go back to jail, or the buggy should be confiscated. That's the law. Obey it. See, but it's our religion. I don't care. There's nothing in the Bible that says you can't put on yellow triangles on your buggies. If there was, I'd be, go Amish boys. Do it. But there's not. It's their interpretation of their own religious practices. The Bible says obey the government or pay the price. They are disobeying God by disobeying the government for their religion. That's a mistake. And they paid the price for their mistake, and hopefully, hopefully they'll learn their lesson. God told them to obey the government unless the government tells them to do something contrary to his will and his word. And there's nothing in his word that says you can't put a safety triangle on your buggy. And besides... It's not just the Amish who are at risk with their darkened buggies. It's everybody driving on those streets. It may kill the Amish guy when you run into his buggy, but it may kill you too. Buggies and horses are big. So their decision was ill-advised. It was contrary to biblical instruction, and I hope they learned their lesson. Rebellion against civil authorities is rebellion against God. Romans 13, 2. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. It's exactly what happened. They brought judgment on themselves because they rebelled against the authorities that God had put in place. So they were jailed. It was God's will that they be jailed. It, they were jailed in accordance with God's will. We're to obey the laws of the land. We're to honor our leaders. We're to pay our taxes. This one saddens me because I, I listened to this minister's videos and tapes. I thought they were, are fabulous. Here's the headline. Dr. Dino gets 10 years in prison after failure to pay taxes. In November 2006, Pensacola, Florida evangelist Kent Hoven and his wife Joe were found guilty on 58 federal counts of willful failure to pay payroll taxes, structuring bank withdrawals, and obstructing federal agents. Hovind, self-styled as Dr. Dino, believes in biblical literalism, claimed that he's not liable for taxes, and his ministry does not have to render unto Caesar because, as he claimed, his workers are missionaries, not employees. Hovind's tax troubles date back to at least 1996, when a judge at Hovind's bankruptcy trial wrote, Hovind, quote, failed to acknowledge his obligations as a citizen and taxpayer of the United States, end quote. The judge concluded Hovind filed for bankruptcy in, quote, bad faith, end quote, and lied about his possessions and income. I'm sure I knew what he was thinking. I shouldn't have to pay taxes because this is a religious thing and not a spiritual thing. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says pay your taxes. Right now, churches don't have to pay taxes. And that's great. What if the law changes? I will lobby against the law change. I will call my representatives. And I will do what I legally can to keep that from happening. But if it happens, guess what? We're paying taxes. Because God told us to obey our government. Hoven thought he shouldn't have to. There's legal recourse. You sue the government. You get a judgment. 
If it's for you, you don't pay. If it's against you, you pay. That's how you do things. You don't just reinterpret it, decide not to do it, and fudge the numbers. And sadly, this man got sentenced to 10 years in prison for doing what he thought was right, but failing to obey those in authority, authority over him, not rendering unto Caesar, not paying taxes to whom taxes are owed. Romans 13, 7, very straight up, pay all that you owe, whether it's taxes and fees or respect and honor. It's very straightforward. I'm just thankful we live in this country because if we don't like something, we can, we can change it. Most countries, they can't. So we are very blessed. I found it interesting. Pay all that you owe, whether it's taxes and fees or respect and honor. Okay, not only do we got to do what they say, but we have to do it respectfully and with honor. Well, here's your money, you stinking government official. No, no. We're supposed to respect these people. Give them respect and honor. What I found interesting, though, was how taxes and money and fees are tied to honor because there's actually a play on words with honor and money. And I learned that when we talked about, in my studies, which I'm going to share with you, about spiritual authority. Listen to this. Okay, so I told you we talk about civil authority. Done. We're going to talk about spiritual authority, but we're going to come back to this honor word. 1 Timothy 5.17. Now, notice it just said in Romans, in the other book, we are obligated to support the government with our money. It's our duty as God-fearing people. Now listen to what it says about spiritual authorities. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, do not muzzle the ox while it's treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. Remember I told you about parallelism throughout the Bible? Well, the New Testament was written by Jews too. So the New Testament also has parallelism. This double honor is in parallel with the worker deserves his wages. So when it says you are to give your spiritual leaders, especially those who labor in the teaching, double honor, it's a play on words. It's the idea of honor and respect, but it's also tied to the ox or the thing being muzzled at the grain, which ties to wages. So I looked up the word, and honor, this Greek word means respect, deference, and reverence. And it also means the price of something or its value. So it was a double play on words because of the parallelism, tying the honor to the muzzled ox, and the word itself, which both means honor in the way we know it and value. Paul was such a witty fellow. So the Good News Bible took that understanding of it and translated it differently. Here's what they did. The elders who do good work as leaders should be considered worthy of receiving double pay, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, do not muzzle an ox when you're using it to thresh grain, and workers should be given their pay. So we're obligated to pay taxes to support our civil leaders, and the same way we're obligated to financially support our spiritual leaders. We're obligated to obey our civil leaders, and we're also obligated to obey our spiritual leaders. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch, they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. A few places in the New Testament, it emphasizes the need of honoring and obeying spiritual leaders. And I, I got the smirk on my face. Because everybody has no problem obeying their leaders as long as they agree with them. I'm sure it wasn't written in there for those times. You see what I'm saying? It was written in for those times that you don't agree with them. But that's when we get all uppity. And that's when we take on Bikri attitude or the Sheba attitude. That's when we take on the Absalom attitude. Your decision is wrong. I'm not going to do it then just step away from me, because when the lightning strikes, I don't want to be fringe, uh, you know. just Because uh, when we disobey our leaders, we disobey God. 
Colossians 3, 17 through 23 now would be the section on family. We looked at civic, we looked at religious, here's the family. We're out of time, I'm just going to read through it. It's pretty self-explanatory anyway. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Yeshua. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And husbands, love your wives and don't be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. And fathers, do not embitter your children, or they'll become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for men. When children honor their parents, they are honoring God. When wives honor their husbands, they are honoring God. When we honor our leaders, secular or spiritual, we are honoring God. And when children disobey their parents, they are dishonoring to God. And when wives disrespect their husbands, they are dishonoring to God. And when men and women disrespect and disobey their spiritual or civic leaders, they are disrespecting and dishonoring the Lord. When all is said and done, our target of honor is the Lord himself. Not everybody in Tucson honors the Lord. Not all of the Jewish community honors the Lord. So I'm praying that between this Rosh Hashanah and next Rosh Hashanah, the congregation Beth Sar Shalom will be active in prayer and in outreach as ambassadors to the Jewish community, that we can win 300 people who are Jews who are not currently honoring the God of Israel and inspire them to do so. I want you to please, please join me between now and next Rosh Hashanah, to pray that 300 more of our people who are currently not honoring the God of Israel will choose to do so. Now, if you're in here this morning and you haven't fully given your life to the Lord, which is honoring to Him, I would encourage you to do so. I would urge you to do so, to give your life to the Lord. Honor, give honor where honor is due. Scripture says that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father, the the Son of God. He who doesn't honor the Son doesn't honor the Father who sent the Son. Yeshua came and he died for our sins. And those of us who submit to him honor the Lord. And I encourage you to join our family. Please join me in prayer. Lord God, we know what the Scripture says but our flesh, our sinful nature, gets in the way oftentimes. And we fail to honor those over us. So please forgive us and help us to start fresh this Rosh Hashanah. Help us to turn over a new leaf where we are the most honorable, honoring, submissive people this town has ever seen. Help us to be strong in faith, like John, never compromising over the word of the Lord strong in society, that we aggressively lobby, vote for the things that we'd like to see done. But honoring to you that when things don't go our way, we keep our chin high and we say praise the Lord. Help us to be this way, Lord, because it's the way you want us to be. And we need your strength to achieve it. And we pray for those 300, Lord. Maybe you have 3,000, maybe you have 30. We don't know, but we pray for 300. 300 who are currently not honoring you who will turn over a new leaf and honor you and your son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now, in just a moment, uh, Michael's going to close us off with the band here. Um, But after that, it's that time of the month where I'd like to meet with the men. If you're 18 years or older, I'd like to meet with you over here by the big speaker on my right, your left, right after services for our three- to five-minute man huddle. You stand, please. Beautiful Lord, one
wonderful Savior I know for sure. All of my days are held in your hand, crafted into your perfect plan. You gently call me into your presence, guiding all of my life through your eyes I'm captured by your holy calling set me apart I know you're drawing me to yourself lead me Lord I Bow your heads for the ironic benediction, you'll be dismissed. And today, uh, not only men over 18, but if you a bar mitzvah age or older, we'd like to have you over there as well join us. Please bow your heads and you'll be dismissed. Ye Sadonai Panavalecho, the same lecho. 
Shalom. May the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. May the Lord bless you. I'll see you by God's grace Wednesday night for Erev Rosh Hashanah. Shabbat Shalom, everybody.